I think one of the worst feelings for a music fan is to go through an anticipated album and feeling left disappointed after the listen because you go through the studio album and either you're a mega fan of the artist or you were highly anticipated through the rollout and then you get the music and you're just left wondering where did this go wrong so in today's episode guys we're going to be going through some of the most disappointing hip-hop albums for us and our opinions and experiences and I want to know in the comment section guys what is the most disappointing hip-hop album of all time in your opinion so Lou how do you feel about this conversation? It's an interesting conversation just because there's so many albums that leave you wanting to get, you know, your money back, leaving you wanting to get that refund for your time, for your your dollar, everything that you're putting into the experience. And it's a devastating feeling, too, just because, of course, if an album is disappointing, it's because you had high expectations for it. Like you said, it could be one of your favorite artists. So it's going to be cool to go through some of these albums and we're going to obviously build up to what we think is the most disappointing rap album of all time. And I didn't bring in too many of the usual suspects. Like For a lot of people, The Big Day by Chance the Rapper is one of the most disappointing, which for myself, I can't really say that just because I wasn't anticipating it all that much. Revival by Eminem is another one that a lot of people were disappointed by. Um, so what about you? Like, Were there any usual suspect ones that you sort of left out of the list? I'll leave one of them for the end of it. Okay. I want to talk about an experience I had in uh, 2017. I think I could do a bit of foreshadowing there. But, I mean, regardless, I mean, the first one I want to bring in for today that I was really disappointed about was Quavo Hancho by Quavo. This nice. was his first studio album. And, I mean, listen, where do I start? We were massive fans of the Migos for a long time in the early 2010s decade in high school. Um, we were listening to um, all of the best, you know, Migos mixtapes and all the hot singles that were coming through. And, you know, I was completely sold on them as a trio. And then obviously you start to ask yourself, how would each of these artists sound individually yep. you know where would they strive would they even be able to carry a full-length studio album and for me Quavo was the clear one back then for like the biggest hit maker you know he was the one that brought the songs to the Migos records I think Takeoff was the best rapper and I think that Offset had the perfect balance between the rapping and also the markability with the hooks obviously he had like the Ric Flair drip hook that was massive back then but going on to this album I'm like wow okay this is gonna be massive um I love the the first culture i was really invested into it all summer of 2017 um i was also a fan of huncho jack jack huncho i yeah. had it in rotation i'm like okay quavo could do no wrong then you get to this and you're like well this stinks this is really not good i'm super disappointed because in my eyes i saw quavo as a top tier performer within the rap genre whatever like whatever it was whether it was his auto-tune crooning or whether it was his ability to make these energetic hits that had the replay value there was really nothing out of this track list that i was taking out i mean the only track i really go back to is flip the switch with drake which isn't even that great of a collaboration i feel like even that's a reach like honestly it's one of the rare albums where i could say there's on a single song that i would take out of it and like you were saying bro it is pretty fucking shocking because when you saw quavo get out of the migos world if it was him shooting out a feature or him making that album with travis scott he was able to carry out energetic performances had the catchiness to the hooks and he was always seen as the front man of the migos the guy that was sort of holding everything together and then you get the studio album and it's disappointing and i feel like that's sort of the narrative for most of the, the, the solo albums coming out of the Migos, even looking at The Last Rocket, which was the best one out of the three, in my opinion, wasn't like the most groundbreaking or, you know, exciting project. I guess the good thing that I got out of this album is that I started to realize that they're just better together. Like, yeah. it'll never, ever, ever be the same. I mean, the only rapper out of the three that I do feel like had a successful solo career, especially with, let's say, Father of Four or even something like, you know, Without Warning was Offset. I do feel like he did strive the best alone, and even some of the singles he dropped last year were fantastic. But yeah, going into this album, you were hyped. Like, this was really the peak of the Migos' popularity, and to see the front man come out with a studio album that didn't hit, in my opinion, I think left me extremely disappointed. Absolutely, yeah. But let me go on to one of my most disappointing albums that I've experienced in recent time, and this is going to be Funk Wave Bounces Volume 2 by Calvin Harris. And the main reason for this is that when it comes to that first installment, that was the soundtrack to like multiple summers for me as a teenager. You had this house producer come in who had a great reputation being Calvin Harris. And he sort of took on this DJ Khaled role where he assembled this A-list cast of rappers and actually produced the beats. Actually had a vision for this project where he was producing these beats that had this nice bright polish, had a lot of EDM 
pop, funk influences, and you were hearing so many rappers get out of their comfort zone. For example, on the song Roland, you had like Future rapping over this modern G-Funk beat, or even looking at like Big Sean rapping over this 80s disco beat on the song Feels. It was so cool to see them out of their comfort zone and performing on a high level for a project that wasn't solely hip-hop based. Now, going into this next album, I expected sort of the same formula to carry over and to get bangers like Feels, like Slide, like Cash Out, and more. Um, but yeah, you I was that. left. I was left like in the in the dust before it even came out because there was sort of like this rollout that continued to progress, and then you only got the album in August, and it's like, well, fuck. Why am I getting this in August? You know, I yeah. want I want to get it at the start of the summer, like I got the first album in. So already, did you ever, that- did you ever see what happened with uh, Jad Talks Music on Twitter with Calvin Harris? Like Jad Talks Music, like had put out a, a tweet. Shout out Jad, he's always putting out crazy content. Um, he had put out a tweet saying that like, how could someone drop this for the first installment, and then you get one of the most forgettable sequels of all time with this one? Calvin Harris replies to him saying, "Well, thank you. I'm never gonna be back in your space ever again." Saying, "I'll wow. never make another hip hop record That's again." Insane. Hey, it what the fuck? Yeah, so, yeah, he, he really picked cheesy. up on the feedback. And it makes sense. I mean, I'm not going to lie to you. Volume 2 had the same staying power as the fucking fidget spinner, bro. Like, <laughs> like, it <laughs> That's fucking, a good one. It peaked one year, and then the same year it fell the fuck off. And I'll be honest with you, the album isn't absolutely horrible. You still have quality performances from Dua Lipa. 21 Savage did his thing. You had features from like Snoop Dogg. Yeah, but then you yeah, have yeah. songs like Somebody Else with Georgia Smith, and you're like... Well, what is what are you doing here, little Dirk? Like, why are you on this song? And there's a lot of mismatches between artists, and it ended up feeling like a DJ Khaled album, just with, of course, a lot of the synth work that you would expect from Calvin Harris and a lot of that summery feel. Um, but a lot of mistakes just, also in the curation process. I think that was such a strong point within the first one was yeah. that everything mixed and matched together. And you did get oddball artists collaborating with other artists. Like, example, like, you had Khalid with Future, right? Like... I never really saw that sort of collaboration happening before, but then they come together for a fantastic track that is still in my rotation to this day. So I completely agree with you, but let me go on to my next one. And this one might take you guys as a surprise because I actually, I've spoken positively about this album, but Jesus is King for me was extremely disappointing yeah. at the time. And I will say this, it has grown on me. I am appreciative of the production, but the replay value was literally none when I ended up getting with it. And I think the the whole thing with Jesus is King with me was that I was so hyped for a new Kanye album, especially after the Wyoming run, and I was so engaged into a new rollout because I'm not sure if you remember before this, you had the whole Yandy saga where it was supposed to come out, you know, in 2018, that October month, it was going to be absolutely massive and then boom. He just disappears. And then after that, you start to see that there's this new rollout coming that through. That was the phase of like Kanye rushing albums, I feel like. Because exactly. 2018, you got yeah, just a year later, you're getting Jesus is King, which didn't even sound fully complete well, when it came out. Not only that, but I just feel like it was too harsh of a transition into gospel music where it just didn't necessarily make sense. And yes, I do think that it was a nice move for him and where he was at with his life. If he felt like he needed to go into that direction, fine. But music-wise, when you get into the studio album experience... I really only think I take like two songs out of here at most. Like, wow, follow God no, and, that, that's a bad take. And, There's and like, a lot of like quality just, songs. Like you have water with Aunt Clemens, but I'm just saying is like, how often do you go through Jesus is King and really spin it from but like start to finish? It's uh, tough. Yeah, I, I don't go through it all that often. I'm not saying there's like, only two good songs on this album. What I'm saying is that there's only maybe two songs I revisit. So the whole disappointment factor with me was that I was super down for a new studio album from Kanye West, especially a year later after the disappointing event of Yandy. And then you end up getting this gospel album where you're like, well, what do I really want to revisit within this? And how do I really put this within my rotation? It's not a bad album, but it's definitely at the lower end of Kanye's work. And I do feel like it was maybe rushed a bit and there should have been some more stuff fleshed out. I think there. there's still some bangers on here. Like every hour, the Sunday service choir fucking sang their That's hearts cool. out. Salah was also good. Kind of felt like a religious power for Kanye. But I'm just going to ask you something. How often do you bump these I tracks? don't go up. I, I'm just, I'm trying to like play devil's advocate a bit. Close on Sunday is obviously a miss. On God is fire. Everything we need is a miss to me. Jesus Lord, the outro is not great. Um, hands on's good. Use this gospel has such a creative beat with like that seatbelt sound. Yeah, shout so out to work. There's definitely highlights within the track list, but I do agree that it felt sort of rushed. It felt like Kanye was being a little bit preachy instead of actually 
outlining outlining and detailing what that religious transition was like for him. Yeah, and I know a big point for you and a big criticism with the studio album is that you wanted to see maybe a bit more writing and in-depth writing yeah. on where he was at with his faith and you know where he was at in his life it was a very difficult time for Kanye and he was finally finding himself back in God and he was finding his faith again. So I think that would have been an interesting transition to attack, but yet... I just, I don't know. It's not something I revisit all that much. And for the hype that I had after, you know, that 2018 run, after the cancellation of Yandy, it just didn't serve me well. So I wanted to bring it into I it. agree with you. Not a bad album, but definitely one of the more forgettable Ye albums. But next up, this might be a surprise to some people. I don't think you will be that shocked by it, but it's Mr. Morale and the Big Steppers by Kendrick Lamar. Wow, And that's tough. you know me and you know the conversations that we had after it just dropped and even after the night of release. Um... I think that with this one, this is definitely the best album that I brought in today. And I, I do still stand by my opinion that it's an incredible album. It was worthy of the Grammy love that it got. It was definitely worthy of being featured on my top 10 albums of the year list. But I waited five years for one of my favorite rappers of all time to drop an album and to smoke on people's top fives. Like That's what I was expecting. But instead, he drops out of the race and says, fuck the greatest title. I'm not going to go in with that mentality anymore. And that was such a shock because Kendrick was one of those artists that made me care about the competition aspect of hip hop. And he cared so much about it if you go back to older interviews. So that mentality of fuck the rap game was definitely like shown throughout the album because you had these more mellow and I would say passive cadences that sort of teether between whispering or spoken word poetry which is fine where it fits, and that's where he was at, but I feel like I got way more passion and hunger, which I was looking for, out of the hard part five, like out of that whole rollout, that was the moment that moved me the most, and that was the one that reminded me, like, this guy is one of the best poetic virtuosos in the world right now. Like, how could you be disappointed with an album that gives you something like Father Time or Worldwide Steppers or United in Grief or a Silent Hill, like a Purple Hearts, a Mr. Morale? There's just so much quality on that album, but... I, I, I think I, still, like, musically speaking... There are still slips with the paintbrush in the sense that you're getting performances on songs like Purple Hearts where the singing falls flat. You have the, yeah, baby, which is it never sounds good for as many times as he says it. I'm never going to really fall in love with it. Um, and yeah, the concept was cool. I love the fact that he was getting as personal as ever and really rapping about generational trauma and giving you songs like Auntie Diaries, which again, another song where the performance is really it's, it puts you in a daze, you know what I mean? In the sense that you're snoozing throughout it because there's it's almost a lifeless performance. Okay, so basically the, the story with you and Mr. Morale is that you were expecting kind of like that GKMC Mad City vibe where he was going to be tearing through everything and you got the opposite of that. I think it's more of just like his performance and his energy throughout it was more subdued than I expected. Also like... He wasn't going after it like anybody's throats. The way that I, you saw him do that in every other album that he had ever done, looking at Rigor Mortis, looking at DNA, looking at... You can find at least a couple of songs in every album where he's gunning to have that top spot and he's being braggadocious. And then listen, that's not what the album was. So again, it's more of a case of I didn't get what I thought I was going to get. But nonetheless, phenomenal album in retrospect. Yeah, it's completely valid because this is basically like what you were disappointed with as a Absolutely. fan. You know? so I think so I, I can't bust your balls on that. The yeah. replay value is still not high for me. After a yeah, year of his past. Yeah, yeah, you've been saying that, though. It's what about you as a grown? Yeah, absolutely. I revisited okay. it uh, quite I think quite a few times this year, actually. But let me go on to my last album before I get into my finale. And this is going to be Live Life Fast by Roddy Rich. Man, was this one fucking disappointing. Because, <laughs> you know, you're coming off of, please excuse me for being antisocial. Um, we had made a video where we said we thought that Roddy Rich was going to be at the top of the game and absolutely dethrone everyone and bring in this new West Coast flavor. And you get this album bro my goodness there's just really nothing you could take out of this i mean um what was it i think that roddy didn't evolve as an artist and didn't show any progressive growth within any of the tracks that he had provided um you had gotten this super serious and really nice rollout to where the visuals were dark it felt like he was going into a mature place with his writing you go through the track says, this is gonna be my beautiful dark twisted fantasy level like come on no exactly and you're setting all these expectations for the studio album and then i genuinely don't know a single soul that really does enjoy 
enjoy this album like that. And I think that the expectations were way too high from the jump, especially after the box reaching that diamond status, you going into, please excuse me for being antisocial and having the massive hits that it did and you having the expectations on Roddy. And I understand as fans, you know, we do put a lot of expectations on the artist, but I do feel like the best artists are the ones that are able to kind of get past that and deliver their best work for their fans and for their community and not give them like these half ass promote like half ass promotions and let's say songs that you're getting on a live life fast and it kind of just like it just felt empty as a release and you're like man you know, i've been waiting like close to what was it like two years for a new it was roddy exactly album. two years it was yeah. two years for a new roddy album what did i really get out of this it's so funny you said it's such an exaggeration not a single living soul likes the album like obviously fucking not no like yeah i think that maybe that's a bit of an exaggeration but come on when have you seen praise on live like that i've never never really seen anyone talk about it yeah and i think the most shocking aspect of that album was the fact that you even had roddy come out in interviews and say like listen i could have capitalized on the hype that i had in 2021 sorry in 2020 and dropped a year later after my big debut album but i needed to live life i had to experience things i had to mature and evolve as a person an artist and then you get like literally him backpedaling almost you know what i mean where big backpedal bro the lyrics are, are dumb there's no real evolution whatsoever there's no personal experience well, i wouldn't say that they were dumb it was just like no i was dumbed down lyricism let's be real it was yeah, yeah, there was a lot of like bubblegum stuff on here where you just don't want to necessarily revisit it. And I, I don't want to take any credit away from Roddy Rich. I think he's still a super talented artist. Just if you have to single out this piece of work, I definitely do think that there's not much you're taking out of it. And Paid My Dues is not bad. Takeoff and uh, and Roddy together. Yeah. Boy, the production Wanda and was Coleman fi- killed The production it. was fire, but yeah. I mean, for the most part, you're getting, what, one beat out of an entire album, which doesn't necessarily feel too right to me. So, yeah. Yeah, that and, was and uh, by the way, guys, we didn't want to include things like Encore, for example, which to me was one of the more disappointing albums, but just because we didn't really get to experience those albums when they were fresh off a of release. So I feel like there's more emotion for us attached to these newer albums. And speaking of newer albums, it's going to take me to Eternal Take by Lil Uzi Vert. And after Love Is Rage 2 came out in 2017, Uzi was at his peak, bro. He had the smash shit with Exo Tour Life. He proved that he was a consistent hymn maker that was making this easy to digest music that was sort of like this ear candy for multiple generations to enjoy and to love. And going into this album, you had to wait such a long time because he experienced leaks. You had the whole concept and idea of like, oh, well, Generation Now is holding my album hostage. So you kind of started to develop this underdog story for Uzi where you wanted to see him be freed and drop the music that he's been working on for years. And that sort of built up more and more hype because he was been talking about this album since 2018. Sort of similar to like an Astral World situation where Travis was hyping that album up for years and years. And um, when it came down to it, it was such an exciting rollout. He made us as fans vote on like which album cover we wanted. And we ended up getting the album March 6, 2020. And the first like red flag to me was that there were no features. And one thing that I loved about Uzi's previous projects... Um, maybe with the exception of like Lil Uzi Vert versus the world, was that you had amazing collaborations on songs like Money Longer or looking at, um, sorry, not Money Longer, 7 Million or something looking at, uh, of course, We Ghetto Flowers and so many other grandiose collabs with Uzi. All you got was sit on here on one feature. So already that was a bit of a letdown. And I also feel like he didn't really give us the album that was promoted. You know what I mean? You expected... In way? In the sense that like besides those skits... It didn't feel like I was in outer space. Maybe due to the lyrics, maybe due to the production styles. So you're, you're disappointed because you didn't feel like you were in outer space? I wanted him to stick yeah. and follow along with the theme of the album. Oh, What's okay. wrong with that? No, that, no, that was supposed to be the theme of the album. I get you. But I mean, like, it's not the biggest red flag with me. For me, it was just a replay value in comparison to his other albums. And uh, Lack of enough, hits, too. No uh, hits at all on this album. Well, yeah, like Silly Watch and other ones that went... And Low they, they didn't go crazy, like it, stuff from Love is Rage 2 and uh, shit. No, it didn't go crazy. But for the most part, what's pretty funny is that I ended up actually enjoying this album later later on. Yeah. I was like, okay, this is actually fucking cool. And there's a lot of good rapping performances on here. Um, it's, He's in his bag on this. He's trying to give you like those quick and aggressive flows. So just to say, like it was disappointing, but I think out of everything that I 
I've brought in today, it's probably grown on me the best out of any other album for sure. Yeah, it's grown on me, but I do feel like when you get into like the middle section songs like I'm Sorry and Celebration Station, they bleed into each other. They start to sound the same. A lot of inconsistencies, production not as ambitious as other Uzi projects. And besides like certain synth variations, a lot of the beats are also more or less the same. So a lot of flaws for me within it. He even and said that he didn't necessarily enjoy the yeah, album. Yeah, he didn't much. even like it that much, but... It's time to reveal our most disappointing albums. You start us off. What is it for you? Man, 2017 Revival, baby. This was wow. bad. Wow, okay. Was like my mo- like, this is probably like my most um, disappointing album just because like going back, I think it's what now? Yeah, it's six years at this point. Wow, already six years since 2017. I- I'm, I'm honestly surprised you could be disappointed. And just before you start, I want to say the reason why is that you got the feature list before it came out. Yeah, but you should have yeah, known I, I, based I off knew, of that. I knew, I knew where this was gonna go, and I just, I, I didn't pick up on it. I, I didn't pick up on it. I don't know. I was still like kind of early in like my music listening days. I was just kind of dumb about it. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. Like another Eminem album. I'm super hyped. Um, back then, I was a big fan of the Marshmallows LP too. That was an album that aged horribly, in my opinion. That I just don't necessarily go back to all that much. And um, Eminem was one of my favorite artists. He's still one of my favorite artists. So I don't want to take that back. But for the most part, you go through this track list, brother, and you're getting literally some of his worst songs of all time. Like, there's really only maybe two songs on here that you could really take out, which is Castle and a Rose. And Framed, maybe. Maybe. But for the most part, you go through this track list, it's empty. It's full of useless pop features. The Lake single with Beyonce was just flat. It was boring. It was sleepy. Um, The whole politics thing just felt kind of forced, and it bled in and out of the content, which didn't necessarily make for a good album experience. Um, I don't know what the aim of the album was, to be quite (laughs) honest with you, because it was kind of packaged as like this relapse recovery and revival sort of trilogy where now you got the third installment of that whole thing, but it's like, what is even the trilogy at this point? All of those albums are so far from each other. So that whole play on the marketing kind of turned me off. The album cover sucks too. Dude, you find Eminem like behind the American flag with his hand like this. It's like a recreation of like, I don't know, blonde from Frank Ocean, but an Eminem turn. So I, I just, I don't know what type of value you get out of it. And you know what sucked is I forced myself to like this album in the first couple of Are you listen. serious? I like, forced myself. Wow. I was like, and then you're, you're going back and you're listening to songs and I'm like, what am I doing here? <laughs> like, what, <laughs> how can I go back to this stuff and feel genuinely engaged in it? And yeah, I, I mean, it sucks because you have your favorite artist of all time. And at the time, Eminem was like my favorite. Like he was like the guy. He was... The only person I had in rotation with a couple of other exceptions, but then you get this, and whoa, it was, it was a train wreck. So it was, and you got Rick Rubin, you know, masterminding the executive production again, and he's just doing these awful remixes of like classic rock songs, and you're like, "Em, you gotta, you gotta put the rock shit aside, brother. It's not for you." And all the political talk too, like, it was a weird approach. The features were so lackluster as well. Even like the only rap feature you got, which was like Fresher, didn't have that memorable like how of a performance. How could you have that? You only have Fresher on your album. Yeah. And I get it. I mean, the whole recovery thing works so well because you have those major big pop artists like a Rihanna or even like a Pink. But and they, they made good songs. And, and, and they made good songs together. But then you're just getting this whole cast of artists where you're like, where does this feature list even fit on this album? Where do you even get this? So I wanted to bring that in. I, I'm still disappointed with the album to this day. I never revisit it. I think it's my most disappointing album of all time. My most disappointing um, is going to come from one of my favorite artists ever. It's going to be Certified Lover Boy by Drake. And this was an album that I waited on for years. And that's because of the way that Drake presented this thing in the sense that he gave us Scorpion. Then he sort of you know, gave us the compilation album to hold us over, which was Care Package in 2019. Then he also gave us Dark Lane demo tapes. And it's like... All of these were sort of like little odors on the side as you're waiting for the main course, which was certified lover boy, which was being anticipated for years that Drake delayed time and time again and said that it was going to be worth the wait and had this huge rollout with the billboards and the whole ESPN date reveal. And you also had the beef with Kanye mixed into it. Like it was all forming into the perfect storm. And I remember how excited we were for this album. We had brought like a bottle of champagne to the studio. I was feeling the spirit. I think I was rocking my fucking like OVO jacket. I really like, I'm like, you were immersed into it. I was immersed into it. Like I was expecting to get 
a very rap dominant album where Drake was rapping his ass off just because, you know, we hadn't gotten that since like 2015. I'm like, this is going to be the year where he's trolling us with like this fucking pregnant, you know, women emojis on the cover and he's going to give us some hardcore hip hop. And instead you get a more R&B leaning album that had a lot of songs that were just recycled concepts looking at like tsu for instance or looking at him sort of a lot of people like tsu though i know or him doing a part two to the motto and to me as much as there's songs that i really love and enjoy off of this like a pipe down or even looking at a love all it sort of left me thinking like this album is just creatively bankrupt it's 21 songs. He sort of tried to capture the commercial success that he got off of Scorpion. And it just, it felt like Drake was in cruise control. Just giving us songs that would probably go number one and not really having that artistic vision through and through. Well, you also had songs like Nice For What back in 2018 that ended up going number one. And even though I don't like God's Plan, it's a much better song than something like Way Too Sexy. But... Yeah, you went through the album and you were just left feeling, whoa, like, what's going on here? Why don't, why don't I feel the same way uh, as I did when I was listening to his past studio albums? And like, this is new Drake, you know? And even going to something like Her Loss, that was above expectations. That was it fucking did. fire. Like, you ended up getting certain arms from him after this release stage where, okay, now we're back. Now we're back on track. This feels great. But yeah, I completely agree with you. And I don't think it's a bad album. I think it's, it's a not. good It's a good album at best. Uh, but like you said, yeah, it just it felt like cruise control for Drake. And maybe you could attribute that to like maybe the environment he was in in the pandemic and what type of creative mode he was in. But at the end of the day, the product that you ended up getting was disappointing. And like you said, you have the race my minds on there. You have the fountains um you have the pipe downs the you have the love balls. i love champagne poetry yep these are all fantastic songs but in the grand scheme of things it's also a bit of a bloated track list so it was nice to see him take a bit more of a stripped back approach you know going into 2022 with a her loss which i really did appreciate from him but i agree with you like we were also we did it to ourselves you we know, did when, we when did. did drake ever drop a studio album that was only rap dominant it was never gonna happen we kind of set ourselves up for failure and what was crazy too is that we were also thinking about oh drops bb king freestyle he has the scary hours ep2 you have the wants and needs on there you have the lemon pepper next. freestyle you have all like... these tracks where he's going crazy lyrically and then you end up getting clb and it just doesn't feel the and same. that's what was unfortunate too is that like the one sure bet for a lyrical masterclass from drake was 7 a.m on bridal path and even that didn't turn out to be a memorable song that's aged so poorly the production's weak like, even that one ended up disappointing me. I think, yeah, I think it's just because it ended up playing into that whole feud that was going on. Which ended up Donna becoming resolved right after, you know. So, it's a timestamp song that I think has aged the poorest. So, even on that end, what does it really serve to the rotation anymore? But, yeah, guys, let us know in the comment section what is the most disappointing album of all time. And thank you guys so much for the support and love on these recent videos. We love you guys. If you are new to the NFR experience, smash that subscribe button, like this video. We love you, and we'll catch you in the next one. Peace.